Warning, some viewers may be too lame to enjoy the following information. This is Leviathan at Canada's Wonderland. It opened in 2012 and stands at a height of 306 feet or 93 meters, features a 306 foot or 93 meter drop, and speeds up to 92 miles per hour or 148 kilometers per hour. This is its brake run. It's really big. It's taller in height than most roller coasters. Here we have Fury 325 at Carowinds. It opened in 2015 and stands at a height of 325 feet or 99 meters, features a 320 foot or 96 meter drop, and speeds up to 95 miles per hour or 153 kilometers per hour. Its brake run is also pretty big, but not quite as tall as Leviathan's. And here we have Orion at Kings Island, a brand new roller coaster for the 2020 season. It stands at a height of 287 feet or 87 meters, features a 300 foot or 91 meter drop, and speeds up to 91 miles per hour or 146 kilometers per hour. Orion also features an absolutely massive brake run, just like Leviathan. In fact, its brake run is 83 feet off the ground or about 25 meters. Now, all three of these roller coasters are built by the same manufacturer, Bolliger and Mabillard, or BNM for short. They also classify as Giga roller coasters, which is any roller coaster that stands between the height of 300 feet or 399 feet. Or if you live anywhere else besides the United States, between the height of 91 meters to 122 meters. In this video, I will be addressing just exactly why the rides feature these oddly large brake runs, and how they are actually genius once you understand what these brake runs accomplish and make possible. Before we get started, if you guys wouldn't mind hitting the like button, that would be greatly appreciated as that helps the channel greatly against the YouTube algorithm. Let me try to squash some of the hate that the brand new Orion is already receiving. Roller coaster enthusiasts seem to despise the fact that the ride is 287 feet tall, which is just 13 feet shy of the 300 foot height requirement to be a Giga roller coaster. Now, if you weren't aware, the term Giga roller coaster was invented by Cedar Fair, the parent company of Canada's Wonderland, Carowinds, and Kings Island. Cedar Fair first invented the term when they opened Millennium Forest at Cedar Point in the year 2000, which they coined the world's first Giga roller coaster. They used the Giga category that they created for marketing purposes to make Millennium Force sound better than any other. They also coined the term Hyper Roller Coaster when Cedar Fair installed Magnum XL 200 at Cedar Point in 1989. According to Cedar Fair, a Hyper Roller Coaster is any coaster between the height of 200 feet and 299 feet, or 61 meters or 91 meters. Cedar Fair even invented the concept of a Strata Roller Coaster in 2003 when the company unveiled Top Girl Dragster at Cedar Point, which was then the world's tallest and fastest roller coaster. A strata coaster is any ride between the height of 400 feet and 499 feet, or 122 meters and 152 meters. And after Cedar Fair invented these terms, roller coaster enthusiasts have taken them to heart, almost as if they are scientific definitions. And let me tell you guys, they are not. The terms are absolutely relative, and for one, are only based on the imperial measurement system used in the United States. If you ask me, they mean nothing coming from the metric system, which the rest of the world uses. And Cedar Fair is now changing their original concept of what a giga roller coaster is. The definition previously required that a roller coaster be at least 300 feet or 91 meters in height, and now they are claiming that Orion is still a giga because it features a 300 foot drop, even if the height of the ride is only 287 feet or 87 meters. And coaster enthusiasts are now bent over backwards because of that. But Cedar Fair can change the concept however they want. They created the concept. The definition of a giga roller coaster isn't scientific, it's a marketing ploy. And besides that, I think the fact that the ride features a 300 foot drop absolutely qualifies it as a giga. What if the ride had a 300 foot lift hill, but instead of a large drop, featured a wild mouse like layout that gradually worked its way towards the ground? Would this be more of a giga than Orion? Heck no. Out of the thousands of roller coasters that operate today or have been built period, there are only eight roller coasters that feature a drop of 300 feet or greater. Roller Coaster Database, or RCDB.com, currently has a census of 5,150 roller coasters. This means that Orion is part of only 0.16% of coasters that are of that size. And if we watch the first drop in Orion, Leviathan, and Fury 325 simultaneously, they literally take the same amount of time. So I don't care, Orion is a giga. End of discussion. Nick Walt, ABC News. Now let's get into the title of the video. What is the point of these massive brake runs found on Giga roller coasters built by BNM? These brake runs are a common complaint amongst roller coaster enthusiasts. Why not have a smaller brake run, like Superman the Ride at Six Flags New England? Or why not have a brake run that is lower to the ground, like Millennium Forest at Cedar Point, the original Giga roller coaster? Well, BNM certainly could put a smaller brake run on the ride, but that would actually make the rides less efficient. And it doesn't appear the parks were willing to pay more money for a longer layout, which also leads to the brake runs we have. Before I explain, you will need to know what a block zone is. 
On roller coasters, a block zone is a section of ride that only one train may occupy. At the end of a block zone is a method to stop a train in case the block zone ahead is still occupied. This is the safety system that prevents roller coaster trains from colliding with one another. The long brake runs on Orion, Fury 325, or Leviathan actually feature an additional block zone built into them to make their rides more efficient. This additional block zone is the first and highest part of the brake run that only slows down the train slightly. The train then clears this block zone and begins to descend down the long slope section of brake run. This first portion of brake run actually acts like a mid-course brake run and allows the ride to cycle many more trains per hour. Typically, mid-course brake runs are placed in the middle of a ride, hence their name. These brake runs allow the next train cycling the track to drop off the lift hill sooner than if the mid-course brake run did not exist. This allows more trains to cycle the track each hour, which allows more guests to board the attraction. Otherwise, the next train would not be able to drop off the lift hill until the train ahead had cleared the slow final brake run. Here we have the block zone diagram for Nitro, a B&M hyper roller coaster that operates at Six Flags Great Adventure. Nitro features a mid-course brake run, along with four more block zones, making for a total of five blocks. The block zones are as follows. The station, the lift hill, the mid-course brake run, which is just referred to as block, the final brake run, which we'll call the service block, and the waiting block zone directly before the station. These five block zones allow Nitro to cycle 46 trains an hour at most, and with its 36 passenger trains, means the ride can pump through 1,656 riders per hour. Now let's take a look at the block zones on Orion, the all-new Giga Roller Coaster at Kings Island. Orion also has five block zones. The block zones are as follows. The station, the lift hill, the mid-course brake run, which we'll just call block, the service block, which is the actual final brake run, and the waiting block before the station. This setup allows Orion to dispatch 52 trains per hour, so even more than Nitro at Six Flags Great Adventure, and with its 32 passenger trains, this equates to an hourly capacity of 1,664 riders per hour. Now without that additional mid-course brake run at the end of the ride, Orion would not be capable of this capacity. Its capacity would be closer to a ride like Millennium Force at Cedar Point. Millennium Force is similar in ride duration to Orion. Both rides take just about 1 minute and 40 seconds from when the train is dispatched from the station to when that train hits the first section of brake run. While Orion is capable of 52 dispatches per hour, Millennium Force is only capable of 36 dispatches per hour. This means that Orion can cycle a whole 16 more trains per hour than Millennium, even if the two rides are almost the same in cycle time. This is because Millennium Force doesn't have a mid-course brake run at the end of the ride. Instead, the ride is a traditional final brake run, meaning the train is nearly brought to a full stop and then must slowly roll out of the block zone. This takes additional time, and only once the train is fully rolled out of that block zone is the next train able to crest the lift hill and head down the first drop. It's a bottleneck on operations at Millennium Forest, and for a ride that is so popular, the bottleneck shouldn't exist. Check out my full video on Millennium Forest for a more detailed explanation. When a park buys a new attraction, they usually know how large of a group they wish to attract to that ride. And for these large giga roller coasters, the goal is to attract an absolutely massive group of riders. Thus, the parks aim to make sure these rides are absolute capacity monsters. I hear that when Cedar Point first opened Millennium Force in 2000, they were extremely unsatisfied by the actual capacity the ride was capable of, especially because the ride's manufacturer, Intimate Amusement Rides, had promised the ride would be capable of higher numbers, but it wasn't. And these giga roller coasters cost a lot of money, so parks cannot always afford to go the extra mile and pay for a longer giga roller coaster like Fury 325 at Carowinds. They will settle for a shorter giga roller coaster because they know the ride will still draw in massive crowds regardless. Hence why we have Leviathan at Canada's Wonderland, Orion at King's Island, and Intimidator 305 at King's Dominion, which are all relatively short in track length compared to other giga roller coasters. Now unlike Millennium Force, B&M designed Orion and Leviathan in a way that a massive amount of trains could be consistently cycled every hour to meet the demand the rides were intended to have. This is a large part of the reason why the brake runs are so large. Now the reason the brake runs are placed so high in the air is because it's much better to slow a train while it's traveling at lower speeds than at higher speeds. To slow down a train from a very high speed requires a lot of force, significantly more than a slower moving train. These high forces can exert a high amount of stress on the braking system and structure of the brake run, which can lead to a lot more wear and tear. With a higher brake run, the train will naturally enter the brakes at a slower speed. Thus, less force is required to stop the train. This means less stress is placed on the structure and brake system, which allows them to last longer. Both Orion and Leviathan feature brake runs that are over 80 feet, or 24 meters in the air, and this is done completely on purpose. Since both rides feature a shorter track length for cost-cutting purposes, this means the trains are still carrying a high amount of speed at the end of the ride. If the brake runs are placed at ground level like on Millennium Force, 
I would guess the trains are traveling at or near 60 miles per hour, or 97 kilometers per hour, once they enter the brake run. By placing the brake runs higher in the air on purpose, trains are naturally slowed down to maybe 30 or 25 miles per hour, or about 48 kilometers per hour, before hitting the brake run. And by having the train hit the brake run at these speeds, these brake runs can effectively operate as a mid-course brake run that can both slow a train down slightly or bring it to a complete stop if necessary, without causing a significant amount of wear on the structure or brake system. The massive brake run is also great from an operational standpoint. With all the block zones gathered together at the end of the ride, it is a lot easier for maintenance and ride operators to manage them. Let's take a look at Nitro. The ride station is here, and the mid-course brake run is on the other end of the ride. Occasionally, Nitro will throw a computer fault that forces a train to stop on the mid-course brake run and then riders on that train must be evacuated. Because the brake run is so far from the station, Great Adventure actually sends a park bus to pick up their riders and drive them back into the park. Also, most roller coasters must perform a block check during morning startup procedures. This is a test to ensure the block zones of a ride are functioning correctly. In order for the block check to work on Nitro, a ride attendant must be present at each block zone to help manually release a train after it is stopped. So a ride operator has to be driven out to the block zone of Nitro every morning to make this happen. Whereas with Orion or Leviathan, the operator simply needs to walk the continuous catwalk of the connected brake run. Or if a train ever stops in the first portion of brake run and needs to be evacuated, riders can simply be unloaded and walk down the continuous catwalk that connects directly to the station building. And when the brake assemblies need some maintenance, you now have all of the ride's brakes placed in the same area. So from an operational standpoint, these large brake runs are magnitudes easier to deal with than smaller but separated brake runs. To sum things up, while roller coaster enthusiasts love to complain or make fun of these massive brake runs on B&M Giga roller coasters, they are actually quite practical and are designed this way for a reason. The brake runs are so long because they feature an extra block zone that most final brake runs don't, which is a quote unquote mid-course brake run. This theoretically allows more trains to cycle the track every hour, which means less amount of time that you need to spend in line. The brake runs begin so high in the air to naturally allow trains to slow down before hitting the final brake run. This helps to reduce the amount of force placed on the brake system as well as the brake run structure. Now the brake run at Fury 325 at Carowinds isn't as high in the air because the ride features over 1,000 feet or 305 more meters of track than Orion, so the train is naturally traveling slower by the time it reaches the brake run. And lastly, these brake runs are much easier to handle from an operation standpoint since all the block zones are gathered together in the same area. This makes performing a block check, evacuation, and basic maintenance much easier. This overall design language seems to be a growing trend with roller coasters built by B&M, and I don't blame Park at all for choosing the system. Other rides that feature this design language are Banshee at Kings Island, which also features a mid-course block at the start of the brake run, or the new Candemonium at Hershey Park. On Candemonium, the first section of brake run is what acts as the mid-course, and the bank swooping turn afterwards is to account for trains that are still traveling at higher speeds as the ride heads into the actual final brake run. So I see a lot of roller coaster enthusiasts making assumptions about rides in the wrong way. As much as roller coasters are designed to deliver a perfect experience for riders, they are also designed so they can operate and be managed in a perfect way by park staff as well. So sometimes, design choices are made based on a park's budget and also just for practicality, hence the massive brake runs we see on B&M Giga roller coasters. I think B&M are one of the best manufacturers of an overall roller coaster product because they truly deliver perfection in all areas. I'd say manufacturers like Intamin or Rocky Mountain Construction do better in terms of the rider experience, but fall behind when it comes to delivering a product that operates perfectly. B&M on the other hand checks off that category pretty much perfectly, and I think the company deserves a lot more credit than the enthusiast group gives them. So I think that will do it for this video. I hope it cleared a lot of the confusion you may have with these large brake runs and I hope this makes you feel less angry the next time you see one. Although I don't think a brake run is something a person should get angry over anyway. I'm certainly excited to try out Orion and I can't wait to go take it for a lap myself. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I hope you learned something new. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you get notified the next time I post a video. Also, be sure to check out the El Toro Orion merchandise store over on Amazon if you want to support what we do here. Thank you for watching everyone. Peace.